Welcome to another episode of the Essential Craftsman Podcast. I'm Nate. We've got a great discussion for you today with Dr. Brandon Bishop. Brandon is a foot and ankle surgeon here in town, and I don't think I've ever had a conversation with a surgeon before, and certainly not one like this where we were free to ask really basic questions and get an idea of the types of things uh, this guy sees on a regular basis. My dad is here with me. I hope you enjoy this. It was really fun to see some of the overlaps between his world and ours. There's a lot of shared tools, shared hardware, and similarities that were just really fun to explore. I hope you enjoy. When I was in school, I remember a lot of teachers saying, no question is too dumb. There's no problem, and I, I really push that to the limit. And I say that because you're a doctor, and I'm going to really ask what are probably some dumb questions. And uh, that's been my role for a long time. And the first of those, you as a doctor are doing surgeries. Do you refer to yourself as a surgeon, or is that kind of a, in the medical lingo industry, whatever, is that a different thing? No, um, I think amongst most surgeons... Uh, we refer to ourselves as surgeons rather than doctors um, because you don't want some most surgeons managing your hypertension or managing your heart or it just seems to be, you know, I deal with surgical problems. I treat things surgically and non-surgically, but I really enjoy doing surgery. So I, you tend to focus on the things that you enjoy most, you know, Scott loves to be a blacksmith. So he probably introduces himself somewhat as somebody who loves, you know, blacksmith work and loves working with his hands and uh -huh. carpentry. And I, I, I guess I tend to introduce myself more as a surgeon than as a doctor. It's, it's always something I've wanted to do. Uh, when I was 12, I was diagnosed with type one diabetes and uh, as you can imagine, that was a life-changing experience, and it changed um, my outlook on many things. And seeing how uh, the physicians I would see helped my life made me that that solidified oh. my desire to do that. Oh, yeah. And I've had family members who have been physicians, and that solidified that even more. And since then, it's always been a goal of mine. The goal has changed in its shape and form, but that's always been the goal. How often do you have younger kids, let's say 16, kind of asking you, should I go to medical school? How do you respond to them? And especially with the medical industry, probably different than it was when you were a kid and certainly different than it was even 10 years ago. So is it, is it still a great field? And if so, who is it a great field for? Essentially, what you're asking is if I would still do it again. Okay, let's ask it that way. Yeah, let's let's get cut to the chase. Um I love what I do. I mean, I love what I do. Wow. I I can't imagine doing anything else. Wow. But knowing now where I am uh, and where I've been, it's incredibly taxing. It's mm. it's taxing on a family, it's taxing on finances, it's taxing on um, and I'm not just talking uh, the time commitment is real. Yeah. I mean, there would be times where I wouldn't see my wife or my kids much. I, you know, I had, when I graduated from college, I had one child. When I graduated from medical school, I had two. When I graduated from residency, I had three. And we've since had another. And I missed some of those moments. Yeah. And, and there's, there's regret or... Um, uh, regret's probably not the right word, but there is an opportunity cost to every decision you mm -hmm. make. I love what I do. I can't imagine doing anything else. Um, but and I'm I'm content and happy with my decisions that I've made. Mm -hmm. But it is, it's real. The cost benefit analysis. You didn't have all the data when you made the decision, oh, no. and but now in in the rearview mirror, you see the cost was higher, but the benefit is higher too. So maybe the oh. maybe the the calculation would have stayed the same. Yes. I mean, I didn't know what I didn't know. Yeah. Now, Boy, looking back, I, I have a, a pretty good lifestyle. I'm able to pay my bills. I am happy with 
where I live and and what I do, and I enjoy going to work. Okay. Way more days than not. So. Yeah. So that's uncommon. I mean, that you know, you you look at the broad cross section of humanity. You even look at the broad cross section of people in in the West. That is uncommon. What you just articulated. I mean, there are there are some. There are maybe a real number, but that's that's pretty good. It's really good. Okay. So in terms of cost. Obviously, there's an expense to medical school that I think a lot of doctors, and you don't need to get into it, but medical school and residency is like a 10-year or 12-year deal, right, before you get a real paycheck? Yeah, about that, yeah. Yeah, so it, you, it would take a while to catch back up versus someone who starts making money. Well, you get paid right in away. residency, but it is not comparable to the amount of debt that you have. Yeah. Or we, my wife and I, we deferred paying on our... Uh, medical school debt during residency. Yeah. So we, by the time we started paying um, debt, we had, we bought a house on our first job yeah. and we essentially had two mortgages. Uh, so you, ma- you made an interesting um, observation about the people in medicine you knew who really helped other people, I think you said, or that had helped members of your family or something that helped you identify this as a worthwhile thing. How much of that satisfaction are you getting now? So uh, you and I both know somebody that you helped. He blew up his ankle in a skateboard accident. He's not, he's somewhere between your age and my age. And he, you guys have become friends. You share a hobby interest and, and you, your, your procedure and you, you're going to say, yeah, well, other guys could have done that. Yeah, maybe, but you were the guy here that did it. And, and he, his life has improved. How much of those happy endings drives your work satisfaction i love it when somebody says you changed my life for the better i was in a bad spot and and you helped me you know get as close to uh, my quality of life back or improve my quality of life from various things i i love fracture care it's it's one of those things that i enjoy immensely you have something like a terrible ankle or uh, calcaneus or heel fracture or some other very challenging case and you putting that back together is like putting an intricate puzzle with many pieces and some pieces don't fit perfectly and some pieces are soft and fragile and some pieces are hard and I love that challenge Mm. I love the the technical aspect of it I love working with my hands I love and I think I'm good at it Mm -hmm. and I I, I find that satisfying, the work itself. But then when you have somebody else who will, or the patient will validate your work, that's great. Yeah. You used to do a lot of remodels. When when the person you did the remodel for said, thank you so much. We this love space, it. We love it. That's yeah. satisfying. Yeah, it's much better than we anticipated. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. The work itself is satisfying, but when somebody will validate your yeah. efforts, it's 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 that much better. Yeah, but imagine right. that on their body where something yeah. was broken and that's now what it's I'm fixed. Thinking. That's where, what I'm where there's thinking. it's literally priceless. There's no yeah. value that could be attached to being able to walk without pain or whatever. Yeah. So yeah. that must be pretty satisfying. Yeah, that's awesome. So talk about the you said fracture care. Is that I guess when people break their foot break in an yeah. accident? Mm-hmm. And and what what are these surgeries? So this is where I'm gonna show my dumb question skills. Um <laughs> When you say reassemble, I mean, what, what does that actually mean? It, it, you, you're cut op- open their ankle. It's all inside the skin. Yeah, sometimes often, I guess. sometimes it's through small incisions. Sometimes it's through bigger incisions. And it's just like it's tweezers and, and little mini screws and kind of just you know the names and locations of bones and you connect puzzle pieces One as of, close as they can. Or how, how does it actually work? Or is exactly. it a trade secret? One of my, no, there's no <laughs> trade secrets here. One of my favorite uh, attendings that I worked with was a guy named Raul Vadia. In, in Detroit, and he would say, what we do is carpentry work. It's just a different medium. You know, I've, I've done carpentry work in various forms a lot of my, my youth and um, my 20s, and it's ve- surgery on bones is very similar to carpentry work. There's different types of screws for different uh, types of bone. There's different and different situations there's different 
um, uh, tools for different types of what you're doing. And so a lot of the tools and different types of bone and screws and all that, it's uh, you put it back together, whether that be with plate mm. or a lot of fractures are buttressed with a plate, just like you put a retaining wall on something. You, it's a... A metal plate or to buttress something up against there to hold things in place. You like put a it back. a scab or a, a splint or something. Exactly. A lot of, sometimes it's a scaffold on the inside of the bone that you're building. Sometimes it's a, a reinforcement such as rebar in cement. Sometimes we'll use even a nail inside a bone to hold that in place while the bone heals. And so I, a couple questions. First of all, I'm guessing most of this stuff is stainless steel, These this hardware? titanium and stainless steel and these metals just don't corrode or degrade ever even do, they, do they come out at some point or they just live in there for life and, and they're depends happy the doing that? they look they they're happy doing that that's crazy yeah the body doesn't reject those metals body just, the body they're inert they the body does not it just reject gets a hold of them doesn't care there's advantages to each Mm -hmm. You know, titanium you can if you have titanium you can get an mri if you have stainless steel you're not supposed to, but right. in some instances you can. So, and that's because MRI is magnetic resonance imaging. And so the stainless steel in your bone is going to pull yep. your leg up against the. Yeah. Well, not really. But yeah. I feel it. Yeah. And there's um, also, you know, there's some people that have like a nickel allergy and there's trace amounts of nickel and stainless steel. So hmm. there's a lot of questions that people ask and, and people aren't really allergic to titanium. I've never heard of any be, being allergic to titanium. So, so did your time in grade as a carpenter give you a perspective on mechanical connections and biocarpentry that the other guys that didn't have that time will never have? What do you oh, think? Oh, absolutely. Yay. Hooray for carpentry. Uh, uh, no, absolutely. I, uh, when I was an undergrad, I worked in a plumbing job when we'd work on a lot of hot water and steam boilers, and we would have to change out serpentine pumps and, mm -hmm. and various motors and things like that. And uh -huh. the guy I worked with, uh, we used to call him the inspector because he wanted every pipe to be at 90 degrees, uh -huh. and he would he would level the pipes, and he, he wanted everything perfect. And you want your surgeon to have a little bit of anal retentiveness. You want <laughs> yeah. your surgeon to do the very best job they can. And I think that knowing uh, how screws work and knowing how metals work, excuse me, metals and wood. I mean, I, I can just think of putting drywall into a stud versus drywall into a, a metal stud. Mm -hmm. They're different. They're different. Okay? Mm -hmm. You might use self-tapping screws for another. You might use wood screws mm -hmm. for another. And just knowing how those two materials work, it, that gives you a strong advantage in working with bones, in uh -huh. my opinion. Uh -huh. so, I get nervous when I'm tightening a screw or a bolt in like an aluminum engine block or something. Yeah. Where you're kind of like, how much more? Oh, man, it's got to be perfect. And if I go too far, I am screwed. And, well, and, and I got to think for drilling in a bone. Uh, you know what I'm talking about. So I do things sometimes a little bit different than other people. I put every single screw in by hand. I never use a drill to put a screw in. Uh -huh. And uh -huh. so sometimes I, I got a little carpal tunnel at the you end bet. of the day. <laughs> but, <laughs> but what we do is so similar to carpentry work. I mean, there are drills, there are torque limiters, there are many different sizes of screws. I mean, there I, are saws, I, there are, there are, there, there are, are saws, there are wire drivers. There Chisels? Are, there are chisels, Gross. absolutely. <laughs> nail guns? <laughs> no, no, I've never seen a nail gun, but That's we use best. solid wires all the time, and yeah. they're not, they're screwed in, they're not uh, nailed in per se. Uh, so what kind of heads, what kind of, are they Phillips, are they Torx, are they Robertson? What kind, What's the penetration in the head of the screw? Uh, it varies. Varies, no <laughs> Sometimes kidding. Sometimes there, there's a hex head. Uh -huh. I've seen a cross or a cruciform head. Uh -huh. uh, one of the most common is called a star drive. Uh huh. That's so, Torx equivalent. Yeah. 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 I've heard you use the term elevator before. Can you explain what that tool or hardware an, is? In an elevator is something to lift tissue off another, like a scraper. It's like a spud for barking a, a pole, bark, peeling the bark off a you log. You know how you use that uh, bar to pull the shingles off of a yep, roof? Yep. Same thing. Same sort of thing. Wow. Just much you, smaller scale. Using a little leverage to exactly. detach something it doesn't exactly. want to be detached. Yep. 
And sometimes, you know, and, uh, periosteum is fascinating because in younger kids and teenagers and when individuals are younger, periosteum is robust and thick. And in older individuals, periosteum like is paper thin and huh. sometimes wet tissue paper thin. Wow. And, and tissues change with age. Everybody yeah. knows that, but it's interesting. Wow. How often do you wish you could bring some of your tools from your garage, power tools or scrapers or whatever, and use them because they're just better? Or does that, is that, <laughs> does that ever happen? Like a drill, for example. I don't think that I've wished things that I could take things from home, but I've wished that I could take things from the OR home. Oh. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. <laughs> for instance, I was changing brakes on a vehicle a few weeks ago, and I, I just this was, I had to get behind the caliper to get this one thing, and I thought, man, if I just had a hemostat to pull this out of the way, <laughs> I this would be perfect. And, and you could bill like 40 grand for that <laughs> brake job. <laughs> no wonder those brake jobs There's are There's so a reason expensive. I do my own brakes, because I'm still pretty cheap. <laughs> so... Oh, that's cool. So how do you practice? Because with carpentry, we can screw up and it's not a big deal, but, ha and you, you have to, in order oh. to kind of get a feel for how to make these connections and ha how, how can a person, a surgeon develop these, uh, these skills and get them in their hands just on what, just with like live cadavers uh, first live targets or well, a lot of it is first watching and uh, residency and fellowship and repetition and watching and videos so, and so reading and, and studying. Watch, you would watch somebody do the same surgery and just kind of just eyes only just watch them go. Oh, I've done a lot of that. And you watched like dozens and dozens or hundreds well, or something. A lot of times when you're a junior resident, you're before you're working, you're retracting and you're watching. Well, and what's retracting? What's that? Holding retractors. Oh, so like spreading and it's like the the open. low man at the construction field, the, oh, okay. the lowest person. Mm -hmm. like shovel gravel. <laughs> it's shoveling gravel. You know, you you're watching, you're, you're like a hod tender. You are yeah. hauling that that heavy Got mortar it. up. You are not actually doing the oh. brick masonry. And you're okay. anticipating. Okay, they're about okay. ready. They're about and you're ready. You're paying attention and you're you're trying to yeah. gauge the timing of things and you're learning the process and the steps and the what should be the outcome and oh. you, know, you learn from good experiences and you learn oh. from bad experiences. I had uh, experiences in residency where I learned things I shouldn't do oh, from okay. watching others. From watching okay. somebody screw up. Exactly. Like, okay. like what? Can you, I'm not going to go there. Yeah. <laughs> so, so there, it, it is a problem. I've worked with guys who have not worked with many other people and they never learned what a good job looks like. All they know is what it looked like when that other guy did the job. And so they can't help but repeat that. And then whatever native intelligence they, they bring. But if you haven't seen a really good job, you don't know what the target is, right? Yeah. yeah I'm a voracious reader. So uh -huh. I am a, I've read many, many textbooks uh -huh. and articles and you know, even YouTube videos. There's a lot of surgery on YouTube. If you uh -huh. want to Google a particular surgery, you can probably see the whole thing. So you've been in residency and you've done all this and you've done all that and you've held the retractors for eight or 900 surgeries and you've seen the, the, you've seen the Jedi masters and you've seen the guys that should be in prison and all of that. What was it like when your first solo where you're the guy in the room that everybody's calling sir. And if there's a question you have to, what did, what did that feel like? Were you, what did it feel like? Your first solo, my first solo was in, uh, in residency. I had a lot of opportunity to work, um, with, I guess with some supervision, but uh, with, with, I had a lot of attendings who would trust me, and you gain confidence that way. Like anything, the more times you do something, there is, you get confidence, and you learn how to do it better. And some of my the favorite experiences I had where I would have somebody say, I like what you're doing there, but let's try this. Uh -huh. And um, because they validated what I was trying. Who, who was saying that? Like the, the doctor, big... The big attending, doctor. yeah. Attend. I, I like what you're trying there, but let's try this. Oh, okay. And several of those mentors um, shaped me, uh, for lack of a better word. It's the best word. Uh, into, I feel really comfortable doing surgery now. There's not a lot that, wow. that I get flustered in. And I had a, a good mutual friend that we have we described being a surgeon the other day as being able to control your fear uh-huh because you know all the bad things that can happen yeah and 
you do your best to mitigate or to prevent that. Yeah. And I I don't have a lot of fear anymore. Uh, I feel confident in my abilities. But of course, the first time you're riding solo, the first time somebody takes a airplane flight by themselves, they're probably scared to death. A Put it on bit. the ground by yourself, son. Exactly. And so when I first started out, um, out of residency and out of training, uh, I started with uh, some easier home run cases, if you will. And then um, as that confidence grows, you go to the more complex cases and... Now I love the complex cases. That's what you live for now. Yeah. Is do you see in surgery maybe among other doctors that confidence being like or I should say the mental side of it just being so important because I could imagine to some extent once you have a little bit of fear or one thing goes wrong you almost at least with other parts of life you kind of you lose your ability to even do a good job because you're nervous and people are watching. Does that happen? I have seen both. I have seen it where somebody because there's things that happen, you know, a screw doesn't bite or the fixation is not adequate or doesn't, uh-huh. things aren't working the way you would like them. You have to have a plan B, C, D, oh. sometimes plan Z. Yeah. And sometimes you have to stay there until it's right. Yeah. And sometimes things take twice as long as you anticipate. And yeah. But a lot of that comes with experience. But I've also seen people who, um, it will look really good. And they they worry that it's not enough. Mm-hmm. That oh. there's a, a phrase: the enemy of good is perfect. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If something looks really good, you need to know when it's really good enough. Mm-hmm. If it's not, you need to know that as well, mm-hmm. and you need to keep working. Mm-hmm. But I've seen people when things are really good, they're not sure, mm-hmm. and they that can be paralyzing. Yeah. You were diagnosed with type one diabetes at age twelve. Yes, sir. So that's a tough diagnosis for a twelve year old. But you're managing that. Yes. You're also a pie baker. I love to bake. Okay. Okay. But that's not my question. I mean, (laughs) (laughs) we'll talk about that off camera. And we'll share a piece of pie. But so around here in Southern Oregon, obesity and um, diet is a problem. Average education around here is not real high. And there are some cultural tendencies that are going to take a few more generations to straighten up maybe. And I have had a lot of people I know and friends who are battling the foot problems that either come from or are exacerbated by diabetes. So you are sort of in a unique position to be able to talk to those people. I mean, you're it. You've got that, and you're their foot doctor. What is that like? Um, I think there's a level of empathy that comes there, and there's a level of <clears throat> fear I mean, I see the effects every day of not controlling an individual's diabetes. This morning, I had to do an amputation because somebody was not controlling their diabetes. You did an amputation this morning? This morning. Wow. Holy smokes. Well, that's... I thought that was a Civil War thing. (laughs) No, it it was a toe. It wasn't a leg. Yeah, but I see the effects every day of that from... If an individual does not control their diabetes, their body doesn't heal appropriately. Diabetes cannot be ignored. It, in fact, I had somebody tell me yesterday that, uh, you know, I just ignored my diabetes for a few day, few months and I ho- hoped that it would go away. Well, that never happens. Mm-hmm. That never happens. If you have it, it's best to do what's necessary and to take care of it. My dad and my mom never let me use my diabetes as an excuse mm-hmm. for anything. And... I think because of that, it made me stronger. Mm-hmm. No, just in addition to me having type 1 diabetes, I have a son who is 7 who two years ago was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. That was one of the hardest things I've ever dealt with because I felt like I, was, I passed on the worst part of me to my progeny, and that's awful. It wasn't my fault, but it's still... Uh, messed with me in the mental game a little bit. But I need to convey to my son that I cannot use that as an excuse and he cannot use that as an, ex- as an excuse for anything. If he wants to be a doctor, then he can still be a doctor. If he wants to climb mountains, then he can still climb mountains, regardless of how he 
of what he wants, he can still do it as long as he controls his diabetes. Mm -hmm. it, it cannot be an excuse for not doing something. Mm. Um, do you think people either overestimate or underestimate the ability of the human body to heal itself? Absolutely. I think that, that people both over and underestimate. And certain populations seem to do both. Children or younger people think they're immortal mm -hmm. and that nothing will affect them long term. And sometimes uh, adults uh, think everything will be fine regardless of the behaviors or habits that they have. For example, smoking delays healing or stops healing mm -hmm. all the time. It's not some of the time. It's all the time. It either delays it or stops it. Smoking does. Absolutely. Tobacco wow. smoke wow. Uh, can stop or delay bones from healing. It can stop wounds from healing. It can stop surgical wounds from healing. It can stop other wounds from healing. And just like uncontrolled diabetes can do similar things. I have this conversation with patients all the time. I tell them, you need to stop smoking. You need to cut back your smoking. You need to stop smoking. There's not a day that goes by in my clinic that I don't say that to people. And when they do, the results are profound. They heal quickly and things get back to where they should. Wow. You and I have shared a love of reading. Yes. Well, I got it. Didn't say that quite right. You and I both love to read. Yes. And as it turns out, we have, we share a few authors, yes. you know, um, and there's no question in my mind that you've read way more technical stuff than I have, but give me your opinion, your experience with reading a book versus an audio book. I, I have really never ingested an audio book. What are your thoughts? I assume you've done some audio books. Yeah, absolutely. I got one. Okay. <laughs> right now. Go All on. right. Talk to me. There is a book called The Gutenberg Elegy by a guy, Elegies, and I can't remember his name, but you would like the book. I'll see if I can find my copy. I can't find my copy. I loaned it. But he talks about that. He loves books. He loved the, the experience of reading. And then he sort of grudgingly in one chapter said, well, you know, the audiobook thing is okay. So give me your, boil that down for me just a little bit before I start either wasting my time or find a way to invest it more appropriately. I love both for different reasons. If I'm driving, I can drive forever if I have an audiobook. And I am always, I, I don't listen to the radio. I listen to podcasts and I listen to the, to audiobooks. I usually got a couple books going on at one time, maybe an audiobook and I'm reading something else. Books are nostalgic in some way. In you know, I still remember the first time reading To Kill a Mockingbird. I remember the power that I felt reading that book. I still remember the first time I read Lord of the Rings or Last of the Mohicans. I remember the the, the excitement I, I felt reading those books. I'm not sure I would get the same excitement hearing the audio book okay. and somebody else. Great observation. Mm -hmm. But I think that reading uh, invokes your imagination a little bit more, and it's fascinating and pow and powerful. It can grip you in and and grab you when you stay up till four o'clock in the morning reading when you should probably go to bed. So does an audio book transport you to another place like reading a book does? Yes, it, for me it does, but it, it, it not as easily. Okay. So the, the thing that I, I don't know that I could give up is the ability to stop, stare at a sentence for a while, run back up the page to the top and take another run at that sentence and see if I understand it differently. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. to, to pause, lay the book down, stare at the ceiling, pick it back up. But an audio book just keeps moving, man. Well, there's a little button you can put on your phone or whatever... Reverse yeah. 30 seconds and then hear that again. Right. And I do that all the time. How often does the reader of an audio book kind of wreck it? You know what I mean? Oh, I, the voice. I tried one, oh. and it was kind of a technical book, human action for anybody who's paying attention. And I kind of had to quit because just like the, the pace and the voice, and I it might not have been the reader. It might have just been designed just that it's not a book that is like a story or that can be read that way. Is yeah, that but sometimes it can enhance the experience. The right. voice. The voice, absolutely. Oh, okay, so it's like there's a flip side to that. Absolutely. Okay. I'm thinking of the classic recording of the screw tape letters, and that man's voice, he's got this beautiful, formal, reserved English accent. Fantastic book, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, That's uh, a perfect, ty that's typecasting, right? Exactly. And, I, and um, I guess everybody's interpretation can be different. Malcolm Gladwell reads his own books. Oh, and, does he? And I really like him oh, as yeah. an author, but his voice... Uh, adds to the experience, I think. Yeah, I think I, I read Tipping Point. Was that Malcolm Gladwell? 
I think I so. I think so, yeah. yeah. And Blink and yeah. Talking to Strangers. Outliers. Outliers. Yeah. I read yeah. that one too. That was pretty cool. Well, thanks for coming on the show, Brandon. Do you, either of you have anything you want to add to the conversation? No, I just I just appreciate getting better acquainted. Appreciate meeting somebody that likes to read a book once in a while. <laughs> yeah, it's really amazing. Um, the things that you see and do on a day-to-day basis yeah. would blow my mind if I saw it one time. <laughs> You know, like amputating a toe, you know, things like that. that yeah. Another day in the office. All right. Well, thanks for coming on. Thanks for listening, everybody. The the uh, comments on EC2 are the best spot to leave feedback or questions. And this is a little outside of our normal conversation. Obviously, Clearly. we are in a different industry, but this is really interesting. And we certainly appreciate uh, Dr. Bishop coming on. All right. Thanks. Well, thanks for coming on. And we will catch you all next time. <laughs>